Do you want to know more about the fintech world and about currency management for fintech companies? You're in the right place. Welcome to CurrencyCast. My name is Austin McKinley. I'm the senior financial writer at Cantox and your host. In this episode, we have the pleasure of welcoming Alistair Cotton, co-founder of Integrated Finance and host of the Finterview, the financial podcast. Alistair, a warm welcome to you and thank you for being here today on CurrencyCast. Thank you, Mac. A pleasure to be here. This episode is sponsored by Integrated Finance, API-first fintech infrastructure you can build on. All right, can you introduce yourself and well, tell us what you do and what your mission is? Sure. Um, so thank you for the warm welcome. My name is Alistair. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Integrated Finance. Integrated Finance is a fintech infrastructure business which helps um, any type of company build and embed financial services uh, for their customers. Okay. And in regards to um, to fintech and currency management, what are the sectors you are most familiar with or you are most interested in? In Cantox, we are mostly interested in with what we call fintech lenders and of course embedded of finance. But what, what's your view here? So I think fintech is a it's a very catch-all term and uh, covers lots of use cases. Um, we uh, we service lots of different types of fintechs, but by no means the entire market. So uh, neo banks and cross-border payments providers, uh, business-to-business lenders. So similar to you guys, um, we service the crypto markets, uh, processing uh, their fiat off and on ramps. Uh, e-commerce marketplaces, and also investment companies as well. So quite a broad um, range of companies, but by no means uh, the entire market. So what are the main challenges faced by by fintech companies um, as their business model is impacted by by currencies in general? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I think there's a couple of trends that are impacting um, businesses at the moment. One is um, the technological aspect of everything. Um, so I think if, even a few years ago, kind of humans were much more involved in the day to day kind of transactional element of all types of um, things, uh, foreign exchange being one element of that. And the, the rise of APIs and the continuing unbundling of the banking stack into many more APIs than kind of um, existed before can present itself as a challenge, also an opportunity, but a a challenge to be able to piece together kind of the services that you need. Um, But uh, what that brings with it as well is the uh, requirement to work with multiple firms to be able to do things right. So, you know, traditionally you might be able to go to a single very large transactional bank to get everything that you need as a as a business or as a fintech and now um, the market is such that uh, there are lots of uh, businesses that can provide services at different levels of the banking stack to you and you need be, you need to be able to pick the right one for you pick the right service and then rebundle them together into into what you need to offer your cu- uh, customers Um, So I think that's one, the technological aspect of it. I think um, increasing globalization as well. So um, I think there was traditionally kind of, let's call it the G7 currencies, which were kind of used and are still used by most um, kind of large institutions. But I think if you're a fintech now, your, your default kind of outlook needs to be very much more global than it used to be. Uh, And that requires um dealing with a much larger number of currencies i think exactly. than 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 existed before also the existence of kind of global retail platforms amazon being the largest um means that for certain types of businesses you know you can access all of these markets in a much more um robust and easy manner but that also brings with it the requirements to deal with multiple currencies, right? So it's it's both an opportunity and a challenge at the same time. And I think that's the same for all of these things. 
And the final and the final thing is we're moving into uh, a different environment financially, right? We've gone through 10 years of incredibly low interest rates and incredibly calm markets, which for the vast majority of the time have, um, I guess for the equity markets trended upwards and for the foreign exchange markets kind of been relatively placid in historical contexts. Um, and and the, the kind of the movement towards normalizing of interest rates is just increasing volatility, right? So it's the, it's the new regime of um, be prepared for kind of much larger moves across all of these asset prices, but make sure that you have the infrastructure behind it to be able to protect yourself from those moves going forward because, you know, we're not talking about kind of small few pips here and there. We're talking about the whole percentage point percentage point moves these days. So um, yeah, I think that's the three the three main areas that I'd um, kind of consider the main challenges. Right. Yes. Well, and, um, I agree absolutely with this as we see as a, the main challenge for those uh, fintech lenders to well to to help them reduce their their cost of funding, especially by removing FX risk and also helping them uh, to manage the interest rate differentials between currencies. Maybe we'll discuss that um, in a couple of minutes. Also for uh, embedded finance, to help them, um, well, secure new sources of revenue. Alistair, my next question is, um, so what are the entities or institutions that fintechs go to when they um, want to, well, to improve what they can offer in terms of currency management? Um. Well, I kind of touched on this on the last question, but I think it's, um, let's call them uh, kind of specialists. Right. And um, gone are the days really where you can kind of get all the services that you need from a single institution. So it's crucial that you can kind of find and work with um, institutions that can cover you in the places that you're you're doing business ultimately. Um, specifically to the currency market, it remains quite fragmented fragmented from corridors and uh, being able to kind of serve and um, open up the open up the markets that you're trading in from a currency perspective is kind of the, the, the first element of that. And you're going to have to go to kind of currency specialists to be able to um, to deal with that. And the second thing is it depends on um, your own stack of technology that you use internally um, and how you want to interact with the financial services providers that you are you're dealing with so um, at the one end of the spectrum it would be kind of calling someone up and uh, asking uh, for, a, for a price etc like that and the other end of the spectrum is fully automated you know capabilities via an API that's plugged into your treasury management system for example and it's um, making sure that you're kind of selecting the institutions based on your business model and tech stack that can support you in that in that growth and also I guess it depends on on, on where in the journey you are and what size of institution you need right. to be talking to that's that's absolutely the case we at Cantox for example one of the most important cases is for those fintech lenders that have a well their loan book denominated in currencies that trade at a forward discount to uh, to their, their currencies there fund themselves in right that's really really a key um a key element there to help them reduce their overall cost of funding now let's move a little bit towards um say pricing and traceability issues what are what is the typical pricing structure for those fintechs fintech companies that you see well, um, I think the, the the fintech market, if I start kind of at a macro level, is going through an interesting transition uh, currently, where um, business models based on um, uh, transactional flow um, uh, maybe are less kind of attractive to investors uh, currently, and so. Um, there's kind of a move back towards, let's call it the, tra the, tra the traditional ways of making money in finance, which is, you know, by lending and uh, uh, having deposit base to be able to kind of earn interest on, for, for example. Um, and I think uh, that, that has interesting kind of ramifications for the wider industry. And it's possible that the uh, transactional based business model is kind of um, 
not dead in the water, but will be on pause for for a little while. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Look, when we um, yeah, us at, at Cantox here and discuss pricing, what we have in mind mostly is the the possibility for those companies to have what do we call a um, a strong API based foreign exchange rate feeder and that allows commercial teams to uh, to use the the foreign exchange rate they need to for pricing purposes be it the spot rate the three month forward rate the six month forward rate and so on and we will come back uh, to that uh, towards the end of this conversation when we'll discuss apis what about uh, traceability in general alistair um so what is it that, that uh, fintechs can do to uh, to be able to trace all their foreign exchange related operations as well as they strive to uh, to best serve their clients i think there's two there's two elements to traceability i think there's um transparency uh both from a provider side and also from a customer side you gone are the days where you can uh conceal i think the fx rates from the customer and hope that you're able to you know use it as a as a huge price um and profit center um the the kind of best example of this probably from a retail perspective is the way that TransferWise kind of approached this where they had very visible pricing to, to their customers and that's kind of uh, was very different in terms of outlook um uh from, from let's say traditional um kind of fx firms um, and that actually feeds into kind of traceability doesn't it so by giving very clear kind of pricing um to businesses it's apps it gives those uh, businesses the ability to kind of much more accurately manage their fx risks um you talked about the forward market as well i think kind of basis points and forward points kind of uh, w working in finance were very well understood, but maybe not from the business side of things. And it, certainly not those those kind of prices transmitted in an accurate manner through to the businesses. Um, so a kind of the, 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 the greater kind of ability for businesses to kind of see how much they're going to be charged, both on a spot basis and a forward basis is a huge net benefit for them. And so I would say uh, kind of it enables those businesses based on accurate information to make better kind of more accurate decisions about how they go and manage their FX risk going forward, right? Because they're able to take advantage, as you say, about potential interest rate differentials that occur in places and, um, you know, potentially use it as a profit center in and of itself. Yes, and, and you know, you just touch on, uh, touch on, a, on a important topic here, um, namely the, you, you said that uh, finance people do understand these subjects, of course they do, but We've seen sometimes a disconnect here between, say, as you mentioned, the finance people and perhaps the C-suite or CFO level, where they are a little bit less familiar with this, these uh, subjects. And it's an important, of course, uh, uh, issue for all those companies, especially when uh, it, it is about managing those interest rate differentials. And uh, by the way, at, at Cantos, we define traceability as the fact that, so, uh, in, along the journey from an entry to a position to a conditional order and then a payment and a so an operation each element has its own um, unique reference number and that does of course uh, uh, provide enormous help for our currency managers now um alistair how do you uh, in at integrated finance help fintech companies exactly is it a of fast connection to the right service? Is it the, the right pricing model? Tell us a little bit more in detail. Um, so Integrated Finance uh, is an infrastructure company uh, born out of the, uh, and built out of the frustration that we as founders experienced when we were building our own um, uh, kind of regulated financial institution, which was there were, uh, you know, a plethora of great institutions that were able to support us um, and ultimately provide services to, to, to our regulated institution. But there was no um, kind of accurate information and any standardization whatsoever in, the, in our ability to connect to those institutions. And so integrated finance is really a way for people who, would, who want to build financial products to have a back end as a service that connects into all of the best in class um, 
supporting banks and regulated financial institutions and currency management um, businesses and compliance um, software and have them be accessed in a single API so that they don't have to spend you know, years of their time and de their developers kind of building out all of this connectivity. And they right. can just, um, w with the proviso really, that we want more fintechs to be created over time. And we think that the way that that needs to be done is, is a technical challenge more than anything else. Because with, there's an ecosystem of phenomenal providers out there already with their own APIs that just need to be connected together. And we want to be like the universal socket um, for people to access those services. Wow, th those are really, really uh, incredibly fascinating topics. And let's go uh, uh, deeper into, into those. I mentioned um, the idea that uh, with API enabled pricing with a spot or three month or six month or uh, uh, so forward rate with all the, the, the pricing uh, markups per client segment and currency pairs, we provide so those companies with what is, uh, I think that what you mentioned here, the ecosystem, namely the, the fact that we can break down those silos between commercial and finance team, is, teams, isn't that just one of the most important topics? There's a, a book coming up from uh, McKinsey um, Consultants, it's called The Ecosystem Economy, and it points exactly to what you say, namely that, well, perhaps trillions of dollars, euros, or pounds await those, or uh, in value creation, right? Await those those companies that are going to be able to tear down those silos. Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, so I think there's a couple of um, trends that are kind of pushing uh, financial services firms towards the direction that you describe, um, which is uh, the that technology is eating financial services. It, it, Mark Andreessen kind of uh, famously said software is eating the world. And I think software is eating financial services at the moment, um, which means that, you know, the, tradi the traditional um, financial services worker, let's say, um, and both internally to financial services firms and externally from the client side of things is moving way more towards uh, someone who is fluent in building software, right? So um, instead of, uh, I don't know, a, a, a traditional uh, MBA from Harvard, it's, uh, you know, it's a, a software engineer that's building businesses these days. And when they come to build these businesses, what they're really looking for is not necessarily um, personal, interpersonal relationships necessarily, you know, between sales and customer. They're looking for a set of APIs uh, and a provider that can do what they want and the ability to stitch those businesses together into a service that they can offer their customers. Um, and I think that is one of the one of the crucial kind of trends that are driving this at the moment. Um, the other trend, and we've kind of touched on this, and it goes back to the software is eating financial services, is the traditional bank, which is vertically integrated, has been completely unbundled into unique software companies and i'm going to call i'm going to increasingly call kind of financial services software companies offering financial services right that's probably a better way to describe them and maybe how cantox now describes itself uh, rather than a traditional kind of uh, financial services company uh, and what that enables um businesses to do is basically plug in the services that it needs at the right point in its journey to serve its customers, right? That's another crucial thing. We're getting financial services into other products at the point of least friction for the customer um, so that um, businesses and customers do not have this you know, a super friction friction process where, you know, they sold something and then have to, it's jarring almost these days to think that you had to log out of a system, log into another system and make a payment for it. Like it's happening at the point of sale, right? That's crucial. Um, and from an FX angle, it is, you know, I have this requirement I need to execute an FX transaction now. I don't want to be leaving that system where I do the calculation for that liability and asset mismatch, let's say, to then have to execute that transaction and then report it back to the other system, right? It's, it's what's happening is the trend that, that two systems are combining and you're able to execute your transaction based on you know the, the data that you're getting in system within that system itself. 
Um, so it's super exciting, this trend. There's a long way to go, um, but it's all, I think, driven by uh, software kind of taking over and the people that are, and, and the people that we're appealing to now as financial services companies are increasingly people who write software rather than people who just use it. Absolutely. Look, there's a, another key illustration for us of API used in the what we call the free trade phase of the foreign exchange workflow, namely, um, if so if you have forward points that are in your favor, for example, if you're selling in a currency that trades at a forward premium, well, you need to capture immediately as soon as possible and in the most complete way, all of your exposure to currency risk. And if you hedge, you're going to generate financial gains. And, and we see some, uh, again, uh, companies that are slow to, to, to react to, to this idea. For that, you need, of course, those APIs, API-based systems that allow you to collect all that exposure from any type of company system, be it the ERP, um, so uh, even spreadsheets, or in, in the travel world, we call that the booking engine or the TMS. All of that is so, so Im uh, important these days. Alistair, you have mentioned, I think, also um, the, um, the story about artificial intelligence, AI, we're a little bit, I wouldn't say skeptical, but um, we, we don't really see an enormous, uh, an urgent need for that when it comes to currency management. I'll tell you in a second uh, why, but what, what is your view in general about, so about um, AI in currency management and in the fintech world? Well, um, maybe I'll touch on um, what I've just mentioned about kind of uh, the need for financial services companies to um, serve increasingly software engineers as their kind of user. And I think what AI has the opportunity to do actually is flip the balance back towards, um, let's say, uh, serving the compliance officer or the CFO. You can see with things like ChatGPT, you know, it is ultimately a English language prompt to code, right? Uh, and so what it, what in theory it might be able to do is kind of level the playing field, so to speak, where at the, uh, the, the, the kind of the trend that I we've just described where um, software is eating the world, ChatGPT almost acts, at least in the, in the, the world that I see, as a translator between um, a, an increasingly technical software world and a, and a human, a non-technical world, right? So if, I, if I'm able to, you know, in plain English, write a prompt that will execute an API at Cantox for uh, for an FX hedge for in three years in the Nigerian Naira. Then I think that's a great that's a great thing, right? Because you can right. you can you're, you're enabling someone who, you know, has the industry domain expertise, let's say, but maybe not the technical knowledge to call an API. Back the power to be able to do that. Um, wider wider uses of AI. I'm probably slightly skeptical along alongside well, you uh, well the, the reason is not that we're skeptical but look it's been mentioned as a tool to uh, improve the accuracy of cash flow forecasts and um well that's something that at least i, I hear us at cantox do not see as a, a crucial requirement in terms of of currency management because if you run a what we call a micro hedging program for firm or say sales order or purchase orders. Well, there's no really. That's not really a, a forecast at all, right? It's uh, it has uh, almost uh, certainty to occur. And if you run what we call a layered hedging program, so the 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 hedge rate is built in advance, and it is not that important for you to have those accurate uh, cash flow forecasts. But it's um so. Let, let's say the, the the reason why we at the moment we don't see much application uh, in in terms of, of currency management. What other emerging technologies do you see going forward, uh, making uh, so their presence felt in the fintech and FX space? Um, maybe I could uh, emergent is probably not the right word here, <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, we see. Um, that the fintech kind of industry needs a higher degree 
some de higher degree of standardization to really achieve um, its, its growth potential. Um, uh, and also I'm speaking from integrated finance point of view here, right? This is our house view, let's say, right. um, that uh, if you look, kind of look back to, to how um, the card networks, for example, really kind of got global scale, it was because of the standardization procedure that kind of Visa and MasterCard implemented to enable the, the ecosystem to kind of um, scale um, to the degree that it had. And we see parallels really to kind of the, the nascent fintech industry as it is now, where there's lots of, as described, kind of bespoke connectivity methods that everyone builds for these systems. Often, you know, there's, um, they act as silo, siloed businesses, let's say. And we think that kind of being able to standardize them standardized connectivity to them is going to enable kind of the next round of businesses and big fintechs to be built on top of that standardization layer. Um, interestingly, I saw that the Linux Foundation uh, last week announced uh, that they're attempting to create a standardization layer between all of the digital wallets, for example. So mm -hmm. Apple Pay and Google Pay currently, you know, if I want to pay, you're on Android and I'm on, on, on Apple, I can't pay you even though, you know, it should be possible, right? Uh, and so so the Linux Foundation are um, attempting to tackle that problem. And um, so it's not really an emergent technology, but we see kind of the standardization being kind of the big play here to enable everyone to kind of play, um, play together nicely and you mentioned ecosystem as as the buzzword, really, like create a more um, a, a, a more useful and larger ecosystem of businesses, um, so that people, lots more people, can access them and grow the entire market, uh, they can grow the entire fintech market. I think is the is the way that this is going to play out. And I think the emerging technology may be on top of that standardization layer rather than. So it would be sequential standardization and then the emergent technology is laid on top of that. And your guess is as good as mine, you know, once that once that's completed, we're going to be in a different different um, different market altogether. Absolutely. Well, look, I don't I don't the, the term buzzwords here. I don't think mm -hmm. it, it applies. It's happening already. Right. So, for example, you can embed swift spot FX payments in dozens of currency pairs or you can uh, well, expand your embedded finance portfolio by seamless onboarding customers and uh, KYC procedures on top of the uh, foreign exchange risk management uh, facilities that you could have for uh, for those fintech lenders. So it's it's gone now way beyond the, the just the buzzword, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe maybe I can just touch on market structure potentially as uh, kind of one of the things that I see happening. So. Um, if I can see that the kind of the future of financial services is the in, embedding uh, of those services into the places at which you and I and everyone else in the world spend all their time. So think payments by WhatsApp um, could be, you know, uh, credit, credit card acquiring via Facebook, uh, currency management in in um in apple pay let's say um and apple and all of these players they're not going to build these services themselves they're going to plug into best-in-class providers in the background to offer these services to everyone it's just too difficult for them to do it um and kind of the market at the moment does not allow um big batches of uh, companies to be like put together into something that you know apple and google can service their customers with right and i see the market structure kind of adding an additional layer let's call it the orchestration layer um mm -hmm. and i think th the orchestration layer is maybe the standardization piece that i was talking about in a different dressed up in a different way um that is going to is basically another piece of technology that sits on top of kind of the regulated banks and the financial services providers and allows um technology firms and the places that we spend all our time to recombine these financial services into weird, wonderful customer experiences that currently cannot exist in the scale, the global scale that is required in this market. Yes, absolutely. 
Well, Alistair, is, um, I think we've covered uh, many issues here. You uh, and I, we could finish with that orchestration layer and that idea of standardization. I think you're doing a, a really, really amazing job there. Um, and I wanted to thank you for uh, the opportunity of having you here on Currency Cast. So, Alistair Cotton, co-founder of Integrated Finance. And thank you very much. I hope you to see uh, another time at, at Currency Cast. Thank you so much for having me. All the best. Thanks to Integrated Finance for sponsoring this episode.